Beverly Copeland. This is the Beverly Copeland Report. Today is uh, Thursday, uh, January the 31st, 2013. I'm glad I had a nap today. Okay. Now, I, I talked about how the second, this, the theme, the thread running through this uh, series, which started yesterday evening, the 30th, is the uh, second American Revolution, where the American political intellectual class, in my opinion, have hoodwinked the powers that be, the traditional power, the, the capitalists, the blue bloods, and the church, most notably the Catholic Church, into believing that the old world order had to destroy itself in, to, in order to save itself. It has meant uh, really that uh, it has, the policies have and continue to destroy the old world order, and it's not saving the old world order. What it's doing is facilitating for the first time in the history of the Eurocentric world, a shift of power from the old Anglo-Saxon or the old, I should, it's more than just Anglo, the old Western European uh, hegemonic position in the Eurocentric world, which today is the world, to, for the first time in human history, to a Polish-led Euroslav, neo-Nazi, neo-fascist, new world order. Clearly and unequivocally, this is my opinion, and I think it is the truth. Now, how it's done, the intellectuals, the scholars at elite schools like Hopkins or Columbia University, they come up with theories, ideas, whether it's the neocon paradigm, the war on terror, what benign neglect, whatever, it is then uh, goes to the United, to Washington, D.C., to the United States Congress, where it is codified, it is made legislation, another word for legislation is law, there are federal laws, state laws, and local laws, it's federal law, applicable nationwide law, and the president then is known as the executive. The president then executes the law or carries out the law. The, it becomes the policies of the United States government. That is how it has been done. And so, again, I think they use fear to hoodwink the American, the Western, not just American, broader, ruling class into thinking it had to destroy itself in order to save itself. It has been an unmitigated, catastrophic disaster. Not to mention other interests which have been part of this process, like uh, the so-called Wall Street, quote-unquote, that has been hijacked and which <coughs> has and continues in my opinion, and I'm titled to my opinion, whether it's through real estate, the subprime mortgage mess, the international credit fiasco, or the, uh, you know, the, uh, the credit card, or just, just looting, a stimulus, trillions in stimulus to Wall Street, whatever it is, they have destroyed and continue to destroy Western capitalism by cannibalizing the global economy, being pigs and just bloodsuckers sucking everything up. So, how have they been able to do this? Because those, quote, Wall Streeters, the people, and really they're not the people who own it, they're the people who manage Wall Street, what they do is, uh, I'll call it loosely, they pay to play. And what I mean by that is that they, um, they, they support the campaigns of politicians who then they disproportionately 
So they're influent, they're able to leverage their power and influence and to get the Congress or state and local legislatures to pass legislation that may be in their personal interest, but not in the interest of um, Main Street or the broader economy, whether it's Europe, our European allies or Americans, it's not in our interest. And what it has done, these policies cannibalize the global economy. Well, one antidote to that, again, Wall Street really isn't the power in the global economy, right? They're not the power. The power are these huge corporate multinationals which are controlled, ladies and gentlemen, by those eight ruling tribes, Anglo-Saxon all, English, Irish, Welsh, Scotch, Dutch, German, Swede, and French. But uh, they have, they're conceding their power. It's like they, it's not a gentleman's tea. They, they, the attitude is, oh, woe is me, the poor little rich kid. These, their little servants, their little managers in Wall Street are buying the American politicians, uh, quote, you know, more or less, supporting their campaigns, and they're putting pressure on them and leveraging, and they're getting them to give them everything they want, and they're destroying Western capitalism, and woe is me. Well, the antidote to that, in as much as these corporate interests have so much more power and wealth, pay, quote unquote, pay to play too. Pay the politicians even more. Politicians stick their finger in the wind. Whoever gives them the most money, they're going to support the policies that serve them. Democracy is the worst form of government, except when compared to all the others, Winston Churchill. And that's how it works. But instead of saying, oh, woe is me, and conceding their power, they have to play the game too. Wall Street would, uh, I mean, even the Jews in the Congress would support the multinationals. That's how much wealth and power they have compared to Wall Street. Wall Street's not dropping the bucket. You know, that's all they have to do, start playing the game, too, instead of on this woe is me. They have to pay, they give complacency. They have to play, you're not supposed to concede your power. It's dirty what they're doing, buying these politicians, but it's legal. And you can't just say, oh, it's dirty what they're doing, it's legal. I'm not going to do it. You better start doing it before it's too late. I hate to say it, you know. If they had done it, we wouldn't have had the, I don't think, the subprime mortgage mess, and all of this, these problems, because they would have leaned on the government, right, to do the right thing. It is not a gentleman's tea. I am struck by how, people say the capitalism, how they concede their power to these to these uh, non-ruling class elites, white elites, and allow them, have allowed them to pursue policies, lean on the government, to pursue policies that are inimical not only to the multinationals' interests, but to the interests of Main Street. When they don't have to, they can pay to play and squash them. For example, the NRA. The NRA let me be frank, the Jews cannot stop the NRA. They can't stop them. They're trying everything they can, but I really, they're paying, playing with fire because those crackers are organized and they pay to play. Now the multinationals are infinitely more powerful than the NRA and the Jewish lobby. The multinationals, if they paid to play, they could own Everyone in the Congress, including the Jewish senators, the, the leaders, all of them. That's how powerful and wealthy they are. Instead of being complacent and the poor little rich kid, everything's being taken away from me. Excuse me? Power is not supposed to concede anything. They could buy, they, could, they have the wealth.
the truth is be told, they own Wall Street. Those bankers that are paying to play, they really just manage it. The whole thing is is, 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 is complacency, and it's a question of, uh, it's not a gentleman's tea. You, it's, you, it's trench warfare. you got to get in there and play to pay to play. So what I wanted to talk about something. Oh, Facebook. I had opened a YouTube account. And I was told this week... I opened it up this month. I was told this week that someone from Germany had ha someone in Germany had hacked it and it was suspended, so I closed it down. I closed it down. That's what I was told. Someone from Germany hacked <coughs> my YouTube account. I can't win. I want to have on YouTube or Facebook I have, wow, over 20 years of um, media work. I mean, some of it really, um, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but really, um, uh, really, uh, really, really great stuff. <coughs> From art to architecture to uh, music to drama to science, technology, robotics. To addiction, to healthcare, to housing, to poverty, uh, to disease, you name it. For example, I recall when I had an, I was interviewing a friend of mine, a very distinguished art historian. We went to Columbia together, Horace Brockington, he's African American. Horace Brockington is one of the foremost authorities on art in the world. So we had like a rap session on art. And I remember I said to him, Horace, you know, in this interview, I said, Horace, you know, I believe that the move in Western art, which really um, took off the move to abstract expressionism, I tied it to McCarthyism in the 1950s. I said, in my opinion, this whole move really to, really this push to abstraction in Western art. I mean, there have been other, but this really, really, really began in earnest in the 1950s. I said, and when I, when I think about it, when I go to the museums and stuff in New York when I used to go, I used to always tie that to, directly to McCarthyism, because the artist, I believe, <coughs> it was a, an attempt to deep, politicize their art. Now when I said that, and I've been saying that before that to people, people would laugh. I don't think people are laughing now. I don't think Horace would have started laughing on the show. But I think that makes a lot of sense. It was an attempt to depoliticize art, right? Because historically the role of art in Western society <clears throat> was not only to um, to document uh, uh, or to reflect the times, uh, but it also was political. You know, it, it was all, not just to reflect the times, but it was also, especially Afri art like African American art, it's a challenge, <clears throat> the status quo. But I think uh, the re I think this whole move, and the French resisted that for a long time, and we discussed that in the show too, but I really believe that, and I don't think, that's when I used to say, I don't think people are laughing now, I don't think Har Ypres started laughing, he said, oh, but when they take the paint and they splatter it, it's so machismo, I really think that, and I think it makes a lot of sense when you, you so things like that, or things when I had these great, uh, um, great jazz musicians, blues musicians, a couple, we talked about how jazz, in my opinion, reflected, um, it really, we know, we all know that jazz is really the only American high art, like classical music is high art, jazz is high art, 
It's not pop music. You have to be an extraordinarily talented musician to excel at jazz. And I said that jazz is um, analogous to, it was, uh, you know, it was the outsider's art using the insider's, <clears throat> using the insider's technology, uh, the, the insider's vocabulary, and, and etc. So um, it is true. And it said it could only have been created by African Americans because we have an enriched view of society. We are, we travel in the inside, yet we are outside. We see the society both as insiders and outsiders. White people only see it as from the, from the inside. <clears throat> I said, so that gives us an enriched view. And I think from that cauldron, that's what led to the development of jazz. And if you think about it, the early jazz musicians were black black because it was something that developed within our community and whites at that time did not have access to our community. So they were black and in fact the first white jazz musicians like the big band and all of that, they were kind of stiff, you know, jazz is improvisational. They had sheet music and they were stiff. Today jazz um, Today, jazz, more whites are able to um, uh, uh, play or excel at jazz because it's taught in the university. They don't have, back in the day, you had to go into the community to learn jazz. Today, you can learn it in a university, and so whites are now able to learn and to excel at jazz in ways they were not when it was first jazz music was first developed. That is analogous to the situation that existed in Germany, right? The late, uh, late uh, 1800s, 1900s, with the Jews, the German Jews being the most assimilated, acculturated Jew. The Germans gave them more opportunity than anybody else had ever given Jews historically. So it's really sad the way the Germans flipped and we had the Nazis. But <clears throat> that being said, <clears throat> those Jews too were outsiders, yet they were allowed to move into the mainstream of German, German society and life. So they had this enriched view from which came so many great minds, Freud, Fromm, Marx, I mean just so many, Einstein, because they had that enriched view the outsider, insider. The great American tragedy is that America did not tap into that creative black genius the way the Germans did with the Jews with African Americans. So we took things like that. I talked about, so, so I talked about, I'll give you something, I talked about robotics and stuff. How it's really not, it's really scary that we, that the fact that we need more people now, all these wars decimating populations are absurd for many reasons, inhuman, unconscionable. <clears throat> but the truth be told is that with the advent of artificial intelligence, <coughs> or intelligence or robots, machines, computers, that can think, think, that is really a, that is really a threat to humanity like we've never seen before. Why? Because these machines are dispassionate, purely rational. Metaphorically, as I said on the show, they think and feel with their head, not their hearts, like humans. We, we, we're best when we think when, with our heads, we feel with our hearts. So if we, uh, if we, robotics creates machines that are smarter than humans, they're going to have contempt for humans, and that's it, folks. The question becomes, can the, and it's, it's controversial whether 
uh, in the foreseeable future. Eventually, they will be. They, they, robotics will be able to develop robots, machines, artificial intelligence that's smarter than humans. Today, computers are not. I'm going to repeat that. At this historic moment, they have not been able to develop computers that are smarter than the smartest humans. They cannot. They cannot. But if they get to that, because one thing, the several things that we can do that computers can't do. One thing is adjust and adapt. Computers can't do that. And they don't have this broad conceptual thinking that a genius has. So, for example, you can program a computer to be a chess master. Yes, but you cannot to this very day. So a computer to be a chess master to beat or challenge the best players of chess in the world. But to this very day, there is another game. It's a game that I learned when I went to the high school, the Bronx High School of Science. My math teacher was the faculty advisor, Mr. Falk. And I was a natural at go. It's a great game. The rules are very simple. You can play it at all levels. I was a natural. It's called Go. It is really the oldest probably the oldest board game in the world. <clears throat> the, the pieces are called stones. They're white stones and they're black stones. It's played on a board with a grid. To this very day, I think the Chinese created Go and the Japanese now are the masters or vice versa. To this very day, with all the super duper high powered computers, they cannot develop computers that can beat the best Go masters, the best humans who can play Go. Go is a game that relies on your abstract conceptual thinking, your big picture thinking. So they have not, they have, uh, this, so people think computers are smart, they have not been able to this day to develop I don't have much time, computers that are smarter than you. So I'm just talking, I mean, I have all these, I have like a library of all these things that I want to put up on a Facebook or YouTube or something like that. Addiction. This, I remember this guy, he came from, he, he was, he's a psychologist, a PhD, and he's done all this research on addiction. And these are some of the things that I discovered and we discussed on that show. That I don't I, I don't use dope. I don't I don't I don't not addicted to it. Never have been. He talked about the fact that people how powerful the mind is. That some people who commit horrific crimes when they're outside of prison, right? Because the craving for drugs is overwhelming and they commit the crimes to get the money for dope. When they're in prison, right, they lose that craving for drugs. They're like people who aren't addicted to dope. Isn't that something? Yet, the minute they're released from prison, something is triggered and they need that dope. And so we did, you know, the implications for that. Uh, what else did we discuss? We discussed the fact, things like the fact that prior to, I'd say, 1950, throughout the history of this country, probably, I mean, you know, prior to 1950, the overwhelming majority of people who were in prison, guess who they were? White males, not black people. There was a fl it flip right now. And that's related to flooding this country with dope and destroying it. Now the overwhelming majority of people in prison are black and Latino. I think we just discussed on this show, the fact on my show, one of these shows I was talking about, Nazis or whatever, that um, in the prison system in this country, there is a neo-Nazi infrastructure. Whites, generally, who go to prisons, join neo-Nazi gangs to protect them from black and Latino gangs in prison. 
There is a neo-Nazi infrastructure in this country, ladies and gentlemen. The Jews have, are afraid of it. They have not been able to shut it down. In the American prison, the criminal, white criminal element is introduced to that element in, to find protection to protect them against the black and Latino gang. Not only that, out in the West, in the far West, there are neo-Nazi organizations. The Jews have not been able to shut them down. There are only 15 million Jews in a planet with 7 billion people. I'm going to repeat that. There are only 15 million Jews in a planet with 7 billion people. Don't believe the hype. The Jews are not in, uh, in powerful. The Catholic Church on one Sunday collects more money than the collective net worth of all 15 million of those Jews. They are not the power. They are used. They're being used now. And privately, when I have talked to Jews about it, they are furious that their leadership sold them a bill of goods. This time it would be different. And this time it's going to be the worst of all when the you-know-what hits the you-know-what. And there's nothing no one can do. And privately the Jews know it because I've discussed it with Jews. I'm Beverly Copeland. This has been the Beverly Copeland Report. So look for Beverly Copeland and Beverly Copeland Report. Uh, I'm going to be on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, one of them. I had started YouTube and then I had to shut it down. Someone hacked it. They asked someone who was in Germany and hacked it and messed that up. I'm Beverly Copeland. So all kind of stuff like that. I'm running out of time. I could go on. I have so many hundreds of things like that, shows like that that I've done over the years. And my newspaper column. I'm Beverly Copeland. This has been the Beverly Copeland Report.